without further ado, our curator of maritime history, Mark Wilkins, is going to take us away on a journey into Maryland in the age of sail. And I can't remember the exact title of this one, but um, you're, you're on sharing screen. So hopefully you can do all that you need to do. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Let's see if we can uh, get this show on the road. Um, all right. Let's see. Everybody see that all right? Yeah? Okay, very good. Minimize this. So, wooden shipbuilding, big subject. Uh, brief overview of influence on, influences on the ocean-going sailing ship. Um, so, we're going to start going way back. Um, and I wasn't kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the oldest boat, uh, dugout canoe dating from early Mesolithic period between 840 and 7510 BC. It's found in the Netherlands. It was made from a Scots pine log. Uh, and uh, it was basically, we know it was made by human hands because there are tool marks present, okay? The uh, illustration up in the upper left is a Debray, Theodore Debray uh, engraving that uh, fairly well known. Most of you have probably seen it before, but this, um, shows the sort of indigenous peoples, North American indigenous peoples uh, methodology for hollowing out a log. And they basically um, let, fly, let fire do the work, basically burning uh, the inside of the log out and scraping it with shells or um, stone scrapers uh, to kind of get the charred material off. One of the interesting things about this is um, the heat from the fire uh, with, a, with a pine log forced the resin uh, to the surface, thus sealing it like a varnish, which was a very slick way of making a boat. Um, they didn't really know why this worked, they just knew it did work. Um, you can see in the distance in the same engraving, uh, the method by which they felled a tree, they built a fire around its base, they packed sod, I'm sorry, moss and clay around the base and controlled the burn such that it came to a point uh, when it fell. And then they did the same thing uh, to the other end, um, by means of tools or, or charring, just like they're doing the inside. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Egypt. Early vessels were um, yeah, mere, mere bundles of reeds tied together. You've probably seen these reed boats. Um, you see these in the cave, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the crypt and tomb uh, paintings in ancient Egypt. Um, reed, reeds basically had positive buoyancy intrinsic to the reeds, so they would float on their own. You didn't have to really make a hollowed out uh, vessel like dugouts or plank boats, uh, the reeds would float themselves. So bundling them together gave basically a vessel that was impossible to sink. Um, yeah, the oldest reed boat was uh, 7,000 years old and found in Kuwait. Okay. You can see the rig of this boat uh, prefigures some of the other Mediterranean vessels that we'll see uh, very soon. Like the Greek triremes, <laughs> 525 BC. Um, yeah, the biremes and triremes are. Um, perfectly suited for the scope and fetch of the Mediterranean waters. That means basically the height and distance of the waves. So there wasn't a lot of wave action on the Mediterranean, which made these shallow draft, very long boats um, with um, a very small amount of wetted hull surface, very fast. And they were war engines. They had a battering ram on one end and these um, double or triple banked oars, um, thus the term by Irene meaning two, tribe being three. And that was the real challenge with at least contemporary scholars is figuring out just how the heck they did this. Um, how can you, because I believe the uh, Cambridge University in concert with the Greek government built the Olympias, which was a replica of trireme, um, trying to think, um, well, a couple decades ago anyway. They tried to match the performance uh, that was noted in uh, ancient texts. They couldn't do it. And they, and they, you know, they had trouble figuring out where to position the Roseman, the oarsman uh, to perfectly uh, get the speed they needed and, and the weight that they were dealing with. Anyway, um, you can see the lower right hand uh, little image here, um, kind of figuring out the various Thranites, Agites, and Thalamites, the various uh, uh, oarsmen on the different levels, and how they basically, how do you, how do you row this vessel where three oars are protruding from more or less the same position without bumping into each other? So that was the real challenge with these vessels. Um, they were finely fitted, um, labor intensive to build, but the Greeks were very proud of them. In fact, when they would, would land in a, like attacking Persia or whatnot, they would um, 
cry out, we're the Greekers, or Greekers, we're the Greeks, makers of the triremes. That was their proudest boast. Not so much classical architecture or jurisprudence or anything else that we think that we attribute to the Greeks, but they were very proud of the technology of, that was represented by these triremes and biremes. All right. So um, we're skipping around quite a bit, but all of these are kind of in a linear um, progression. The Venetian arsenal, 1150 to mid 18th century. This is by far and away uh, the first evidence of a military industrial complex in the Western world. Um, this was a very um, well thought out, well, um, well, just well designed um, factory to produce these uh, Venetian um, war galleys. Uh, now, importantly, you're going to hear a lot about a lot about this shell first construction. Now, what that simply means is the skin of the planking of the of the vessel was done first, and then the framing, the keels, the interior stiffeners were added next. So it was built shell first, okay, and then internal uh, timbers were added after that. And basically, each part um, was very ingenious. I mean, uh, most of the Chinese and the Venetians had. Uh, basically dibs on the assembly line process well before uh, anybody in the, before Henry Ford did for sure. Um, but anyway, they had bins of numbered labeled parts in the precise order that they needed to be used. And basically these uh, hulls, once they were together, were floated down a canal within the arsenal and more parts were added to them in a very quick and systematic efficient method. So they were to turn these out. Remember we, remember we talked about European expansionism last time and how the Venetians kind of had the monopoly on trade in the Mediterranean. Well, that was reinforced by their galley production. The galley production underscored their successful trade because they could protect uh, the merchant uh, fleet. All right. So just a, a little um, illustration here. This is a model in the upper right hand corner of one of these Venetian war galleys. Um, yeah, floating frame construction and finely fitted planking. That's the shell first um, construction method I mentioned. Preeminent war machine in the Mediterranean, many oars and crew, battering ram grapple and board tactics. So that's what you did. You basically rammed into the opponent's vessel with that battering ram, that beak head that protrudes off the front. You went at very fast speed based on all of these oars. Uh, again, shallow draft, um, very low wetted hull surface. So it moved very swiftly. And you had a couple cannon, which you could also use. Um, but primarily the tactics were to come up, smash into your opponent, throw grappling hooks onto the uh, opponent's vessel, board it, and, and kill everybody on board. Um, and you can see this illustration down below of a battle of this type. Very close quarter fighting, lots of sword play, lots of pikes, um, whatnot. Um, so this is way before the advent of cannon, which, I mean, in, in, in quantity that would uh, change tactics uh, in a very marked way. So the Battle of Lepanto, late 16th century, this was the last major engagement. We talked about this, I believe, last lecture in the Western world. It was fought almost entirely between rowing vessels, the Turks and the Venetians. Uh, the Turks were defeated and, um, you know, the, these uh, galleys and, gla and gla glasses um, were basically the, the, the type of um, vessel that was used uh, to affect this victory. And some of them were quite large. Uh, you can see this lower um, one in this lower corner here has three masts, latine rigged um, sails also could be uh, used as square sails depending on the wind. And I uh, also see this uh, forecastle here, this um, raised area at the bow, which archers and um, other fighters could, could basically fire down upon uh, enemy vessels. All right. So here's, if there's one thing that you take away from tonight, there's two major types of construction uh, methodology that continue to this day, clinker versus carval planking. Clinker or lap strake, as the term implies, the planks are lapped or overlapped over one another, kind of like clapboards on a house. And at the joint, they're riveted through um, or lashed through and riveted um, to the framing. Carval is basically planks are butt joint along the uh, frames and they're so smooth skin and flat. The clinker uh, have these laps, these very pronounced ridges. Um, so two different types of uh, construction methodology. Clinker was practiced in the north by the Vikings, Dutch and English. Carvel developed in the Mediterranean and gradually spread west and north. Uh, so it's like we said, the, um, the war galleys were all carvel planked vessels, okay? So, we have to talk about the Vikings because they were the, basically the, the masters of these uh, clinker vessels. I mean, talk about 
so I won't say decades, I'll say centuries ahead of their time. Um, if you look at modern vessels, modern rowing vessels, or like for example, um, New England whale boats, I mean, the dead ringer for a Viking uh, longboat, uh, same type of um, uh, double end, uh, shallow draft, beautifully, um, beautifully fitted planking that made a very fast and weatherly boat. So this is basically occurring from 790 to 1066 uh, AD, 1066 being, of course, the Norman Conquest, Battle of Hastings. Um, these were shell first, uh, but not unlike the galleys, they were clinker construction, okay? They were shell first, but a different type of shell. And we'll get to that in one second. The Osberg ship at Oslo is the, uh, the, basically the primary artifact that we have that informs us about this. Um, so you can see some of the iconography with the um, figureheads that they use. These, these, the Vikings felt that these vessels um, were living things imbued with magical powers. These dragon heads were meant to frighten and alarm uh, the, 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 their enemies, and they did for sure. The Vikings uh, added to that with their uh, sort of bravado and, and uh, sort of um, reputation for bar, sort of a barbaric um, fighters, basically, okay? So seafaring Danes, um, let's talk a little bit about how they built their boats. Um, this is a wonderful illustration that shows you from left to right, kind of the progression that was used to build a Viking longboat. So you basically started with a keel uh, blocked up um, and shimmed to basically be level. Uh, then you added a stern post and a stem post. Um, and if you can see, I don't know if you can, these little, these little jagged edges. Now, instead of like we do today, fitting a plank into a rabbit, which um, is let into or carved into the stem, these were basically um, attached to these points here uh, very quickly and efficiently. Um, more, not quite butt joints, but close to it. Um, this was all built uh, by eye. The master shipwright would lay these planks on the keel and basically use weight. Um, I don't think they show it here, but stones largely to get the shape of the planking amidships and these large, they look like, um, well, they're clamps is what they are. They're meant to pinch the laps together where the planks overlap one another so they can be um, riveted, okay? So the Vikings did these by eye, um, and shell first, you can see after the shell is basically going, they're starting to fit frames in this third uh, illustration here. The frames are fitted to the planking and so forth and so on. Uh, there's two lower decks and then um, an upper deck and the mast uh, step is amidships. So that's kind of, I mean, I'm oversimplifying this greatly, but this is how this was done. Um, the planks, I don't know, I'm not sure whether the, the Danes practiced charring, which was a method of softening the wood like the English did. Um, I'm not sure about that, but that's basically you build a fire and you put a plank on it and you heat it up such that the lignin in the wood softens up and makes the wood pliable, okay? Today we do steam bending, which is much more efficient because it doesn't char the wood or destroy it. Uh, anywho, so that should give you a pretty good sense of um, the Viking methodology. These boats were, I should also mention, in a seaway in the North Sea. These boats were meant to flex, and they did uh, over uh, that sort of epic seas. They were meant to flex and twist with the water, thus they wouldn't break. The framing and planking wouldn't wouldn't snap or shear. Um, it kind of many of these frames were lashed to the uh, planking such that it was able to work, as we call it, or move as it uh, made its way through a seaway. So late Middle Ages, 1200 to 1500 AD. So this is really, um, this kind of, that was kind of the preamble. This is sort of the birth of the ocean going carrier that um, would basically become popular in the 15th, 16th centuries. Um, began with what were known as cogs. These were very um, uh, ugly, <laughs> but tubby uh, sort of load carriers. Um, slow, ponderous vessels, um, good carrying capacity. They're meant for trade, okay? Um, we know about the COGS construction due to the COG found in Bremen uh, and discovered in 1962 and it was built around 1380, uh, about the time of the Black Death was spreading through Europe. Um, so from this artifact, we're able to glean quite a wealth of information on how these vessels were built. Um, they had a flat bottom, with what are called floors, which are timbers that run perpendicular to the keel and support sort of the first few planks um, out from the keel. Knees are basically, um, well, you know, where a branch joins a tree, well, that, how that 
wood sort of blends into one another. That's a that's what knees were. The, the grain of the wood followed the curve, and that was used to advantage uh, to build these um, sort of knees, as they were called, uh, for these vessels. Um, they, had, they had clinker sides, um, which is a hybrid. They had, so they had carval plank bottoms with um, clinker sides or lap strake sides. So it was a hybridization of the Mediterranean galley and the sort of northern tradition of clinker boats. It was a good inter-Euro carrier. And you know the Chinese invented not only gunpowder, but the rudder. So this was the first introduction of the rudder to European vessels on these cogs. So that's also a very noteworthy uh, component because the, uh, the Vikings used steering oars to steer their longboats, um, which nom nominally effective, certainly not as effective as a rudder. So, so here's a little drawing that gives you a kind of a good sense of the midship section of a cog. So you see these flat planks on the bottom, those are the, the carval planked ones. And then this transition is called the turn of the bilge, um, where it moves to lap straight construction up to the shear. And shear strake is the top of the boat. Um, Keelson, this is a deck beam. Uh, it's braced up on the keel. Very sort of clunky, heavy construction, but it was sturdy. And that was the point. Um, basically, this thing could carry wine, it could carry grain, it could carry all of those commodities that we talked about last time uh, around uh, the, the Mediterranean and, and, and beyond. Okay, these things could make it up to England. They weren't great sea boats because um, they just weren't. So um, they kind of kept close to shore. And like I said, they were slow but good cargo carriers. So caravels, and I remember when the Portuguese um, went down the coast of Africa and around um, Cape of Good Hope eventually, uh, they needed an ocean boat, okay? They needed something that could handle uh, ocean waves and the winds that they encountered there. So this basically led to the de design and construction of these caravels. These were developed by the Portuguese in 1451, as I just mentioned, intended for these voyages to Africa. Their origins were in the galley, right? They had the smooth skin planking like the galleys did. They were Latin rigged, that means fore and aft, just like some of the galleys here. You can see it on each mast. So that meant they would point really well into the wind. They were, they were more weatherly, what's called weatherly. They're able to, to sail closer to the direction of the wind than some of these other vessels. Um, some of Columbus's ships were caravels, as well as Diaz de Gama, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I mentioned they were ocean going carval plank. So you can see a couple of things are happening here. Um, they're a little bit narrower than the cog. They have a full deck. If you look at this lower illustration, there's a railing on the stern castle, the bow is pointed up to basically lift it above the larger swells that are found out there. Um, so it's, you know, there, you'll see this all through the history of shipbuilding and boat building is using the waters that these men are meant to travel upon to influence the design, okay? <clears throat> so the Carracks, we have to talk about these guys too. Um, these are better cargo capacity than the Caravels. They also, well, they have all, yeah, they, unlike the Caravels, they evolved from the cog. So that sort of tubby uh, little thing that we just saw a minute ago, well, these Carracks were much larger and they, they had the notable addition of these high foreign stern, uh, foreign stern castles. And that's these uh, constructions, these superstructures on the bow of the boat and the stern of the boat. And basically what those were used for um, if somebody were to grapple and board your vessel, you'd put your archers up on these castles and you'd fire down into the well deck to repel boarders, okay? So they had a functional purpose. Now, they made the boat, um, uh, well, they gave the boat what's called excessive windage, which means the amount of boat protruding above the water was such that these boats would often get blown off course. They weren't as sleek and, and maneuverable as, as the caravels, but they were good load carriers. And um, as we'll see in a moment, they could carry something else, cannon, which um, would sort of revolutionize all of shipbuilding uh, shortly. Uh, what else? Yeah, they facilitated the Portuguese slave trade. So they were good carriers like the cog. They were good carriers. They needed to be to take all these slaves back. Um, developed between the 13th and 15th centuries. Santa Maria, Columbus of Santa Maria was a carrack. Okay, so he had a mixture, carracks and caravels. So let's talk about the Spanish a little bit because their uh, methodology was very different <clears throat> and involving and basically evolving concurrently with the others. Iberian shipbuilding, um, like the English, the Spanish would also learn from the Venetians. We'll get to, we'll get to that in a little bit, why the, what the English did, but um, yeah, involved very differently. Um, they used a midship preassembled frame in the middle of the hull. Now, this is very different from anything else that we've seen thus far. Um, this is the first hint of frame-first construction, which we'll get to at the end of the talk. 
Um, but the Spanish were doing this early. Um, bows and stern, the bow and stern framing were uh, basically informed by that. I mean, the shapes of those frames were, were dictated by what were called ribands, which are flexible battens of wood that were bent around the frames and led into the bow and stern. Um, unlike England, Spanish shipbuilding was state funded, so it was able to uh, move forward quickly without um, fuss or muss in terms of uh, the private sector. Uh, and like the Venetians, Iberian shipbuilding was somewhat form formulaic in its approach to construction. So this is a Spanish um, midship section, and this is a frame that is uh, rigid. It's fastened to one another um, using these dovetails and these pins, which are called trunnels, is, which is a corruption of tree nails, uh, sort of shortened to trunnels, and also um, iron fastenings as well. So it's made a very sturdy frame uh, way ahead of its time. I don't know why the English didn't copy it, although at that point, the English, yeah, I think Spanish was basically something to be avoided. So as I mentioned, um, basically these ribbands, these flexible battens were bent. The um, middle part of the boat was uh, built to a pretty simple formula in terms of its shape. And then the harder parts, those frames that sort of had to taper in and um, blend into the bow and stern were, the shape was dictated by using these flexible battens or ribbands. Um, yeah, the carbon-14 dating of the Kaiser Soto ship dated from late uh, mid uh, 15th century, and the Iberians are most likely influenced by the Genoese as, as opposed to the Venetians. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> so Philip Castro is a scholar who's done a lot of research and um, scholarly writing on Spanish shipbuilding, and he did a lot of very valuable reconstructive work. Um, on Iberian shipbuilding that occurred during the 15th century. From him, we know much of much of this um, based on archaeological evidence and his pouring over period tracks on shipbuilding. So here again, we have the stern posts, the keel, and the stem, these midship frames, which are prefabricated. You can see above uh, these, these uh, frame first elements. And then these ribbands, these flexible bands that are bent around this midship section, led into the stern post and the stem, and they basically plot points along the keel, uh, basically these, these two battens and more, this doesn't show them all, were used as control points to kind of uh, plot on a, on a grid on a flat surface, the uh, frames for the rest of the boat. And there's the transom framing here, and this is a finished hull showing the various stepped stern castles and the one four castle, all right? So this is a fascinating site. I would encourage you to visit it down here, hcpwalboa.com in English, if you don't speak Spanish. <laughs> this is a Basque replica of the San Juan whale ship, which is being built in a traditional way by the sea factory um, of the Basques. And this picture was taken um, probably a couple of years ago. They're much further along now. The hull is just about finished. So if you want to see it, I would encourage you to look at it. It's fascinating. It really is. Even, I mean, even if you're just mildly interested in wooden boat building, it's just fascinating to see um, how they put this vessel together and the research that they used, which they, is also on the site. You can see, again, a better illustration of the Spanish system of joining frames. This dovetail here, which is a locking joint, it's basically slid up and locks into place and it's secured uh, thwart ships, or I'm sorry, fore and aft by these pins. So if you know anything about a dovetail joint, you know it goes in one way and can't come out another way. Well, this is the same with this. It was a mechanical wooden joint that was um, secured by means of these pins so it couldn't move around. Okay, so I'm sorry if this is inordinately technical. If there's something that you don't understand, just stop me and ask because um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, prefer you keep them to the end, but if you've got something that's just you can't, you can't restrain yourself. Go ahead and ask. Uh, this is an Italian midship section drawn as drawn by uh, Matthew Baker in 1570 uh, and a Portuguese section. So you can see there's, um, if you're familiar with English shipbuilding at all, this is a, um, it's getting closer to what we would consider Tudor shipbuilding in the uh, 16th and 17th century. Uh, and this Portuguese, these are these, these caravels, very simple. These are all based on, um, basically arcs of a circle. These sections were um, a very simple system where there, a certain distance was plotted along either a uh, vertical or horizontal axis. And then an arc was drawn 
uh, to, a, to another point, and then um, that was it. It was very formulaic in the way that this was done. Now, this one on the right has many more arcs of circles, many more tangents that are used to basically inform these arcs. The shallower arcs are taken, as you can see with this um, pivot point, much further away than these shorter arcs, which are done uh, this way. Now, these are all these distances for these sections were all plotted on a table. So if you're the boat builder, all you need to do is read this table, draw your lines, and to get your, um, your compass or your measuring device out and plot these points and draw your arcs. It was very formulaic and it worked. Um, so people of um, sort of average skill could at least help with this. It would still take a master shipwright to put it all together, but uh, anyway. Okay, getting to the early modern period, approximately 1490 to 1800. So now we're kind of skipping over to Tudor shipbuilding, um, which, uh, yeah, so Henry VII, we talked about him last time, encouraged and started to build the English Navy. Um, and there's a quote that to increase the Navy in England, no goods or merchandise shall either be exported or imported, but only in ships belonging to the king's subject. So we hear this ad nauseum with England right up through um, the colonies in America. This is basically a paraphrasing of the Navigation Acts, which is basically consolidating trade, uh, basically, you know, monopolizing trade. You have to use English ships. It would, it would then expand to English sailors sailing English ships. Um, yeah, belonging to the king's subject. So a way to sort of control trade. Uh, Henry VII also invested in dockyards and merchant vessel expansion, the oldest dry dock being built in 1495 in Portsmouth. And Portsmouth is still alive and kicking, so and there's many fine uh, vessels down there if you want to uh, see that, including the Mary Rose. Um, I don't know why I put the Tudor Rose in there, combination of the uh, Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York. Um, those of you that <laughs> Those of you that are watching the Game of Thrones, you see the uh, the morphing there, Lannister and Stark, Lancaster and York. They're talking about the uh, the Tudor, uh, the bringing together of those two empires in Britain. That's what that's based on, loosely, albeit. Um, Anthony Rolled by Henry the Seventh uh, Navy. That we know this from the uh, this is the yeah the Pippa's Roll. Um, basically, all of the the royal ships uh, were drawn in this role. Um, and Henry VII's navy was comprised of these large carracks with lots of cannon. It's very, very top heavy. We'll get to that in one second. So um, Henry VIII, uh, the guy really liked guns, okay? <laughs> he, was, uh, he just loved those cannons. Um, wanted the new navy as England was still in the periphery. Wanted to consolidate English power and notions of empire by building this grand navy that could rival Spain, of course, uh, so what did he do? He imported Venetian shipwrights to build his new fleet in the early 16th century. Now, this is a fascinating thing because basically when he did this, he imported this fatal flaw in English shipbuilding, which was this shell-first system of planking. Now, that worked fine with galleys, but when you're talking about these large carracks and caravels and whatnot, um, galleons, this didn't work so well, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Henry VIII built dockyards on the Thames at Deptford and Woolwich, um, yeah, both were close to Greenwich where Henry had a royal palace. He loved ships, he loved cannons, loved to be close to it and part of it. Uh, but, yeah, both the first naval dockyard at Portsmouth. And he inherited the regent and the sovereign from Henry VII, these two large carracks, but he built um, many, many more. So Henry Grasadieu built from 1512 to 1514. Um, it was one of the first to feature gun ports. Um, cannon at that time were of heavy bronze. They were very expensive to build. And these vessels were very top heavy. Now it was okay that they were top heavy because guess what? They didn't venture far from shore. They basically, most of the time, stood in the harbor as these uh, sort of symbols of state power and pride uh, and as a warning to foreign nations that we've got this, these, these magnificent ships with all these cannons, so you better give us favorable trade relations. And that's just the point. Um, or don't go to war with us because we'll come over there and. And, and, and blow up your ships with these things. Um, it was built, rebuilt, the same vessel in 1546 with a lower top sides and iron bronze cannon. So already, I, yes? Calvert Marine Museum. What? Calvert Marine Museum. Yeah. Okay. Are you having pie for dinner? Huh? Hello. Okay. So already they were struggling with um, these stability problems that would, when you combine these large, um, soaring stern castles and forecastles with a lot of cannon, 
Um, you know, anybody that um, has a boat knows, or a sailboat anyway, knows that it's best to keep the weight down low, right? Um, you don't want the weight up high because then your boat is inherently top heavy. And this is just the problem that the, the English, nobody really understood this uh, that well at this, this time, this notion of center of gravity and where it should be on a boat. It was all trial and error, okay? So Henry VIII's Carrick's, um, yeah, King Henry's Voyage to the Field on Cloth Gold in 1520, painted in 1540. So basically this is just a very, what I was talking about, these ships stayed in the channel, they hung out, they, they stayed close to one another as these um, symbols of state power, okay? They really weren't meant to be used in any kind of effective combat way, they were just meant to scare people. Um, and if you ever were on the decks of one of these things in a rolling sea, being so top heavy, they'd scare the captain and crew most of all. <laughs> so the cannon, as I mentioned, the original cannon were cast bronze. This was a, a difficult process to do. It was a very expensive process to do. So these bronze cannon, if they saved nothing else on a boat, they would definitely take the cannons off to be reused in other vessels. Um, wrought iron was finally um, discovered and, and, and used, and found, when it was, foundries uh, cropped up all over England to meet the demand. Henry wanted iron cannon on all his vessels. Um, so this is basically the break from the grapple and board tactic to the standoff, what's called standoff and fire. You have all these cannons, you don't need to come in close to your opponent's vessel anymore. You can stand off, um, you know, 500 yards or whatever, and fire into the vessel, the, your opponent's vessel with these epic cannon. So this was birth of new tactics that would continue on to World War II for that matter, okay? So let's talk about the Mary Rose. We, we really should because she is one of the, well, she's perhaps the only principal artifact in existence from this period. She's at Portsmouth, and there she is, uh, what's left of her in the lower right uh, corner um, she was launched in 1511, took 600 large oaks or 40 acres of woodlands to build. Now you know the story, it's true that every um, uh, tree that was basically allocated for the Royal Navy was branded with a seal on its trunk saying, you know, if you cut this down, you know, there'll be severe penalties. Um, I, don't, I don't know if death was one of them, but I think it was. Um, these trees were basically a guy, a forester would go through there and a sawyer and they would pick out these trees for the king's ships, and they would brand them with a hot iron on the trunk. This is a king's. Uh, this is for a king's vessel. You can't touch it. Um, so, as with the um, Henry Grasse Dieu, it was rebuilt in 1536, capsized and sunk in 1545. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is this was an epic, and this is why we have her because she sank close to shore in uh, fairly deep water and was preserved in the mud. So um, it's kind of fortunate this happened. Now. The reason she capsized, I don't know if you can see in this Anthony Roll illustration, but the guns, the lower gun ports are very close to the water. With the Mary Rose, they were only 16 inches from the water to the lower sill of the lowest gun port. So what that meant was if you weren't paying attention, um, or even if you were and a breeze uh, popped up suddenly causing the boat to heel and those gun ports were open, well, that would flood the lower gun deck and basically drastically affect stability, right? In a very quick way. So this is exactly what happened to the Rose. Um, a breeze puffed up, she healed, her gun ports, lower gun ports were open. They couldn't uh, haul in the guns and close the ports in time and she capsized. <laughs> Not funny, but it is kind of funny because Henry VIII was on shore and watched this whole thing. <laughs> so she was carval planked um, and uh, like the uh, like our humble uh, cog, she had a, a hybrid construction, carval plank, but clinker stern castle. So uh, carval plank hull, like in the Portuguese fashion, but um, uh, clinker or lap strake stern castle. Okay, so different, different, uh, two different types of construction. Yeah, so um, Peter Marsden's Mary Rose, Your Noble Ship, it was published in 2009. It's a wonderful a uh, collection of books that documents the entire artifact right down to the drinking goblets that they use and there's immense amount of material culture found on board the Mary Rose that tells us how the sailors lived, how they ate, how they uh, fought, all of that, um, how they were dressed. Um, so it's a wonderful uh, catalog and book and has wonderful line drawings of every, every piece of wood they found, including the large sections of the ship. Um, yeah, when, when archaeologists, archaeologists first surveyed the rose, they were struck by the disorderly appearance of the framing plant. Uh, 
Timbers were often of regular lengths and breadths. Adjacent frames were frequently not joined to one another, like the Spanish did, in the floating frame style. Meaningful patterns of framing were not obvious. So this is kind of what we're talking about with, uh, even back to the Vikings. They built these large carracks uh, frame, shell first. So they fitted the planking first and then fit the frames to it afterwards. So it was kind of done in a plank a few um, courses of planking, add some frames, planks, plank some more, add some frames. None of these frames were contiguous to one another, so they didn't touch and they weren't fast one another, which made this hull fabric inherently weak. And this is basically riffing off the, the Venetian tradition. This is how the galleys were made, but the galleys were so much smaller and so much more lightly built that it really wasn't a problem. And, and especially in the Mediterranean where the water is relatively calm, at least calm compared to the North Atlantic. Um, Oh, uh, let's see. So yeah, in the book, it continues considering the Mediterranean style carval planking had been practiced in England for only half a century. We sought to identify to the extent to which frame first assembly principles accompany this innovation in planking style. Now the, the results were inconclusive. Yeah, variability in joint morphology contrasts with wrecks from Portugal and the Basque country where dovetail mortises, especially between floor and fetter commonly occur. So basically they're saying they were looking for some evidence of frame first construction in the rows. They couldn't find it, um, just underscoring this notion of the Venetian influence, one, and two, this um, uh, shell first construction. And nobody has really come up uh, in my thesis, I hypothesized about a way they might have done it, um, but nobody really knows uh, how these vessels were built. Um, uh, it would be wonderful for somebody to just focus on that and come up with a workable solution. And many of these um, techniques and skills were lost with the uh, shipbuilders, uh, unfortunately. So this gives you a real graphic sense of the floating frame construction. You have these planks on the outer side and here are your frames and they don't touch one another. They're joined to the planks but here's the weakness right here where they don't touch. The frame is only as strong as, as its length uh, transits. So um, right in here, this, this is a very weak joint and this caused what we call the hull fabric to work or move excessively in a seaway causing a lot of leaks. And there's a lot of evidence to support this. Development of the Tudor Royal Dockyards um, close to Lawn Thames like Deford. Um, yeah, so basically, um, yeah. Most of the Navy's shore facilities stayed in operation, unlike their medieval, medieval uh, predecessors. So these dockyards were um, basically modeled on the Venetian arsenal. They they've imported Venetian um, shipwrights. Of course, their kind of their their sensibility was this type of construction. So they conveyed it directly to the English, and that sort of developed a very systematized, codified uh, dockyard uh, space and production assembly lines, and which served England well. Even though the ships they built were inherently weak, they built them in an efficient fashion. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this this whole effort of building the dockyards, building the navy, uh, increased demand uh, for shipbuilders in the first quarter. Uh, yeah, for the yards were Deptford, Woolwich, and Portsmouth, employing 520 shipwrights between them. Royal master shipwrights became people of real significance and status. It elevated the craft as a whole. Uh, this was not something that, you know, here's this guy and he plays with wood and he, can, he builds boats and he gets drunk at the end of the day. This was actually somebody of status and of res deserved respect in the community. Um, the granting of a royal charter in the shipwrights company in 1605 was a sign that the status changed. Uh, elevated the craft hitherto been organized organizationally weak. Yeah, so you have these companies and these guilds, right, that sort of came together to build vessels and larger vessels. And of course, the royal vessels were the most sought after um, in terms of shipwrights, the positions to be had because it's a steady paycheck. So appropriately enough, Matthew Baker became its first master, master shipwright. Now, Matthew Baker, we'll get to him in a little bit. He um, has fragments of the ancient shipwright tree, was one of the first tracks to sort of put down on paper all of the stuff that had been swimming around in these master shipwrights heads and an attempt to um, codify uh, what had been kind of an art up until this point. So Elizabethan seafarings, 1558 to 1603, uh, as we talked about, uh, I think a little bit last time, uh, England made its debut into the Atlantic world by state sanctioned piracy. Um, Elizabeth kept her capital ships close to England through an invasion. She was she knew the Armada was coming. Remember, 1588. So she kept her her big capital ships in close. wouldn't wouldn't put those out to sea. And good thing she didn't because they probably would have sunk. <laughs> so during this period, Drake, Frobisher, Sir Walter Raleigh all made exploratory privateering voyages, and they all had an impact on vessel design. Um, we'll get to this a little bit and a little bit. As you know, we talked about this last time. The Roanoke Colony was a base for piracy. 
Uh, it was far enough away from the Spanish gold and silver trains to not risk reprisals, but close enough to be able to attack them. So it's kind of striking a, a fine balance there. John Hawkins um, reworked, he was uh, known as Queen Elizabeth's slave trader. He reworked the English fleet during the 1570s, basically cutting down some of these epic stern and forecastles to make a more weatherly uh, purpose built uh, or more functional type of um, hull. And these were called race built galleon. We'll get to that uh, picture of that in a bit. So two years before the Armada clash, Matthew Baker's Fragments of Ancient Shipwright Trees published. And this is basically a compendium. Baker got all the credit, but it's basically a compendium of uh, theories and philosophies put forth by Hawkins, Raleigh, Drake, um, Frobisher, all these people that have been out in the Atlantic world and basically how to build a vessel that will survive well in the Atlantic world. 1588, we have the elemental uh, armada clash, basically cementing uh, English, well, maritime ascendancy such as it was. I mean, it was basically the southern part of the channel um, really wasn't um, an Atlantic experience per se, but it, it, it the Spanish were defeated, um, so that was the main thing. Uh, and also, the Armada marked the ascendancy of the cannon. This is the end of the grappling board tactics. Basically, the English just pounded the Spanish to dust because the Spanish was already with their warriors and their pikes and their swords and their cutlasses and their grappling hooks. And guess what? They were being bombarded by these, these you know, epic salvos of cannon fire from the English fleet, and they didn't get a chance to see them fight. And what was left of them wrecked on the Irish coast. And that's um, so. Um, let's talk a little bit about, this is a lot of material, so um, forgive me, the galleon, which was mid 16th century, a refinement of the Carrick. We know the Carrick well from Henry VIII's um, Navy and before. Now, interestingly, um, it had um, a flat stern. If you see this up this uh, picture on the upper right hand corner, it had a flat transom uh, on the stern versus the um, Carrick, which had a basically a Dutcher double end tucked um, stern. But this was much easier to plank on the right than the left, okay? Um, there were new proportions in terms of the hull to keel uh, to beam length ratios. Uh, the Carrick's, the um, galleons were a little bit uh, skinnier, a little bit uh, more weatherly, able to go out in the Atlantic. They weren't as tubby and uh, overcharged as it's called, or, or uh, uh, excessive topsides as the uh, Carrick's were. The common gun used aboard a galleon was the demi culverin to demi cannon. This is a slightly smaller than some of these larger cannons, siege cannons that were used in Henry VIII's uh, navy. They had a long, prominent beakhead, and that's this this thing out here, which would uh, which still survives in, in in some vessels like our skipjacks. You still have a uh, cutwater and, and trail boards that that uh, mimic this in some fashion. All right. So the Dutch, the Dutch did. A, I mean, Dutch were eminently practical, pragmatic people, and I hate to make cultural tendencies, but they were. Um, they revolutionized um, many aspects of shipbuilding. Um, Dutch liked to make money, so if they could make a vessel that was more practical to sail, required less sailors, right? Because each sailor had to be paid, so less crew to operate. They basically what they did um, was they made. Um, more practical, um, more practical system of rigging. Mechanical advantage via block and tackle was used extensively uh, with the Dutch because guess what? The mechanical advantage could do the work of three men with one man pulling on the line. So this was a huge thing for the Dutch. And then of course it was co-opted by every other uh, Navy in the world and merchant fleet. Um, but the, basically this um, painting by Cor uh, Cornelius Verbeek uh, circa 1618 to 1620, uh, shows a galleon on the left firing at a Dutch uh, warship or flute on the right. And you can see the difference. Look how much lower the Dutch hull is compared to this tubby galleon. So this is, you know, this vessel is going to be able to be much more maneuverable in a wind and in a sea than this thing will, because it has so much boat out of the water, the wind's going to blow it off course a lot, in spite of its best efforts to stay on course. Uh, so just wanted to throw that at you. So. Sir Walter Raleigh, um, again, Atlantic explorer and very colorful character, wonderful um, to read his tracks about the places he went. Um, I love what he has to say about His Majesty's ships. Um, and is it any wonder he ended up in the tower? Uh, it was also very behooful that His Majesty's ships were not so over pestered and clogged with great ordnance as they are, where there's such superfluity 
as that much as it serves no better use, but only to labor and overcharge the ship's sides in any grown seas in foul weather. So he's talking about these big ships like the Mary Rose or the Henry Gressage going out into the Atlantic with these top heavy, you know, towering vessels. And they're a mess. They, they, they sink, they, they, they capsize. He's telling them, you know, you need to put, place your ordnance, your, your cannons down low and not so many of them. You don't need all those cannons um, to do the job. Um, and this, again, is a direct correlation between Raleigh's Atlantic experience, um, which was very something very different from the coastal trade and the channel, um, channel clashes that occurred, including the Armada. So, um, and here's Raleigh on the Rose. Um, he's basically talking about uh, the proportions of the hull and what it needs to do. Um, be stout, same as provided, performed by a long bearing floor. So this is making flat on the bottom, right? Um, it wasn't so rounded, which facilitates uh, the boat being somewhat tippy. So a long bearing floor by sharing off water, even for a lower edge of the ports to carry out her ordinance in all weather. Um, he's talking about uh, basically placing those gun ports and those guns um, precisely where they need to be, not so close to the waterline, like the uh, like Henry VIII's ships, but high enough so they, they're clear of a, of a grown sea um, and they're low enough uh, that they provide a good uh, center of gravity, okay? Um, yeah, uh, he, <laughs> I love how this last sentence, we shall then be enforced to take it by all your lower ports or else hazard the ship as befell to the Mary Rose, a goodly vessel, he is a qualifier, uh, which in the days of King Henry VIII instantly sunk down right. So he's talking about, oh yeah, the Mary Rose is a great ship, but you know, she sunk, so we don't want to do that again. So just follow my instructions and everything will be fine. <laughs> so I mentioned uh, John Hawkins and his reworking of the fleet. Now John Hawkins reworking the fleet was the fleet that engaged the Spanish at the Armada clash. And part of the reason they were so successful was, was what John Hawkins did. He, um, as just like Raleigh, he gleaned a lot of this information from the Atlantic experience and was able to cut down those top sides, uh, make it much more like the Dutch flute, right? Um, not so many cannon, um, a more purposeful rig, easier to control, easier to sail and manage. Um, so this was a much, I mean, you compare this to a galleon, which we just saw, this already has a market advantage in terms of maneuverability uh, of the hull and the, and the, and the ship when, it, when, it, when it's under, underway, all right? So I mentioned Matthew ba Baker's fragments. Here's some excerpts, and they're just wonderful. I mean, look here, he's likening um, this um, galleon. You know, it's a galleon because it's got that flat transom back here, but he puts a fish over it, basically showing you that just like a fish, which is so successful at moving through the water, the hull of a ship should be uh, similar proportions as seen from above as a fish, okay? So, um, and here we are with this wonderful drafting table with a drawing, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, most of, maybe I didn't, most of these vessels were built on what's called a mold floor, which is a planked flat floor. The portions were, were taken off, ticked off with large compasses and measuring devices. And then these arcs of circle were drawn just like on the right to get these sections. And then the frames were basically, um, these these shapes these floating there remember they're still floating frames so these sections were taken off on the timbers and then fitted to the planking but this is how the vessel was drawn here's he showing it drawing it on paper and here's a draft on the lower left showing some contr uh, key control points you have a midship section you have a forward frame um, a frame sort of following the uh, quarter of the boat and then a transom and um, this was called a uh, rising line, this, this, this line down here, and this is called a narrowing line. These were two control points um, to sort of reference the frames of the vessels relative to one another as they move from the stem to the stern, okay? And as I mentioned, Matthews Baker's uh, fragments, I have a copy of it on, on microfiche I got from the uh, Peepson Library in uh, Mary Magdalene College in England. And it's fascinating, it really is, to see sort of how these, um, bits of information are sort of compiled and interpreted by Baker in this tract. Right. We've already mentioned this, um, the Armada Clash, um, so I don't know why I put this in. Yeah, cemented England's maritime ascendancy, at least with regards to the channel, anyway. <laughs> um, so this was a, a, a turning point for, for England, of course, and you can see up here in the upper, this illustration up here, that's the, the rest of the Spanish fleet wrecked on the Irish coast, and this illustration of the uh, battle itself, okay? You have a gall uh, gallius down here. Gallius is, is one of the vessels in the fleet. I should mention that 
in parallel to these carracks, these large state ships, England was still building galleys. They, they, they were. That was still seen as a viable war machine. So these galleys were still being built in parallel with these large state ships. Okay. One of my favorite pictures of all time, there's Elizabeth with her hand on the world, uh, notions of British Empire and world domination. Um, there's her fleet out here. There's the Spanish fleet wrecked on the Irish coast up here. She's not smiling. Why is she not smiling? Well, Elizabeth loved sugar and her teeth were all black, so she would never smile for a portrait. <laughs> Love that sugar trade in the West Indies. <laughs> okay, so Tudor merchant vessels. We talked a bit about the Navy. Um, these were basically the proportions of the Tudor merchant vessels, keel by beam by depth of hull divided by 100 gives you your tons burden or carrying capacity. Uh, this tons burden origin originated in the medieval border wine trade. You know, basically, that's just what it was. It was a, a unit of measure. It still continued, continued to this day. A ton, a, ton of, uh, a ton of wine, a wine ton was basically this unit of measure. And that's how many wine tons you could pack into the hold of a ship give you that many tons burden, OK? So the line between merchant and naval was somewhat fuzzy during this period. And this actually, except for the, yeah, the Grand State ships of the Mary Rose. So um, most merchant vessels were also armed. Why? Because privateering and piracy were, were rampant on the high seas, of course, had to be protect yourself. And also some merchant vessels received state subsidies to become naval vessels during war. Now this was to continue in England right up, right up to the Second World War. I mean, you remember the Lusitania, the ill-fated Lusitania? Well, she was built with an English subsidy that in times of war, she could become an armed cruiser. This is why the Germans had her listed as an armed cruiser, and this is why they torpedoed her. Anyway, um, so this was done, um, this was done even at this juncture. It was a great way uh, for a merchant captain to get help get his vessel built. He said, in time of war, you will be co-opted into the Royal Navy, you'll have to serve. Um, but you know who knows when there's going to be a war. So in the meantime, you get your ship built and you can you can make a living. So Mayflower II and Susan Constant, these are two replica vessels that um, are from that period. You can see Mayflower II. She's in Plymouth, um, and this was drawn by William Avery Baker, the, the he's a naval architect. Much research. We should be very grateful to him for his research on 17th century vessels. He came up with the, the plan for Mayflower II. And uh, as you know, out, and she was sailed over, I think in the mid fifties from England as a thank you to the United States from England for Lend Lease during World War II. England said, well, we can't pay you back, but we're gonna build you <laughs> a replica of the Mayflower to remind you Americans that you were once British. You gotta love the British sense of humor, you really do. So anyway, this is a, um, <laughs> this is a quote or a description um, from that voyage when Alan Villiers took Mayflower II across the Atlantic, talking about heavy quartering seas. Alan spoke to me about matters that were causing him concern. In other words, he was scared out of his mind. He did not like the way the fore and aft mast worked and the bowsprit. Fore mast was, in his, his opinion, a little better than a naughty broomstick. And the cordage and rigging allowed too much play. So this whole thing was shaking and twisting and just nuts. Um, Main mast moved laterally about 10 inches or a foot at its head with each roll of the ship. The foremast stumbled and threw all of its rigging forward like a hard mouthed horse jerking at its rider. All these things may have not alarmed Captain Jones in 1620, but they certainly alarmed our captain. <laughs> so you have to really appreciate the guys that took these vessels across the Atlantic. They were not good vessels, okay? They were not, um, not by today's standards anyway, but they did it anyway. Many of them didn't make it as port books attest to, but many of them did. And, uh, you know, Mayflower leaked. She, as you know, she had a cracked deck, deck beam. They used a, a printing press to jack it up so that she wouldn't ship too much water. Um, and uh, Susan, uh, if you've ever been down to the Jamestown colony, you can see the uh, Susan Constant um, and what, what are the other two? The Discovery and I forget the third one anyway. And of course, we being Marylanders now, the Ark and the Dove, uh, each uh, dessert, I mean, you need to, uh, those of you that haven't been to St. Michael's to see the construction of the new Maryland Dove, you should do it because uh, they're starting to plank her. She looks like a ship now, and it's quite exciting. Um, so these brought the first Maryland colony over, the Ark and the Dove. Uh, the Ark was much larger, 400 tons burden. The Dove was catch rigged at 46 tons burden. Uh, both ships were hired by Cecil Calvert to begin the Maryland colony. Uh, transported around 200 colonists to Maryland. It was in 1630. Three to 34, 66 days at sea. So a little over two months at sea. Uh, after crossing the Ark returns to the England and Dove was used as a coastal trader. Now it's interesting too, because um, 
This is Dove as a ship rig, which is what the old Dove looks like. And the new Dove has a um, has catch rig. She only has two masts and it's a huge um, uh, fore and after rig sail um that uh well go, you should check out the website it's it's uh, for the uh, chesapeake bay maritime museum you can see all about it you can see the whole process from soup to nuts and um it's fascinating i'm very excited to see that vessel i think it's due in historic saint mary's um in about a year i believe so so back to our um I mentioned the mayflower briefly in that voyage so this is this is basically speaking to this framing of uh, this this floating frame uh, weak hull fabric that I keep talking about. Well, here's a tract that basically explains it very well. They're gone to sea about 100 leagues without Land's End, holding company with Mayflower all this while. Master of the Speedwell complained his ship was so weak that he must bear up or sink at sea. In other words, he's got to turn around, for they could scarce free her from with as much pumping. She was leaking like a sieve, okay? So they uh, came to consternation, consultation again, resolved both ships to bear up back again and put into Plymouth which accordingly was done, but not, what, what's interesting is no special leak could be found when she got dockside. So it was judged to be the general weakness of the ship and that she would not prove sufficient for the voyage. So she didn't leak in calm waters because that type of vessel was designed for calm waters like the, the Mediterranean galleys. But when she was in a heavy seaway in the North Atlantic, all of that stuff would work and twist and play heavily such that um, it would leak like crazy, right? Almost sink. If that isn't enough for you, here's mid 17th century voyage of the Dutch ship Fox. And this is basically a court case where the Dutch want to be reimbursed for the ship because they insured it. Um, testification, all the seamen belonging to the ship called the Fox concerning the insufficiency of the said ship having found a miss in her, her left knee being broken, planks working the fore and, and her hold, thirdly, planks and knees betwixt decks working, bolts broken and trunnels, her sides working uh, both from the deck, um, found a great leak. All her seams afford and above water, very leaky. Yeah, so again, beams broken, all of this thing is it's seemingly coming apart at sea because it's so um, poorly built in terms of, well, not poorly built for protected waters, poorly built for the North Atlantic, all right? So, oh yeah, so this is English arrogance. Um, this is from the complete shipwright. This is 1664, so moving towards the, moving towards the end of the 17th century. Carpenter ships or the like may be removed from England to Virginia or New England or the like countries where timber is plenty for their use. Yet through their ignorance, they durst not undertake such a work for their sakes. I've written this book. Oh my God. It's so funny because look at this. By 1730, Thames shipwrights complained that American competitors in Boston, New England were putting them out of business. They were building these, these schooners and these vessels so well uh, that they were putting the English shipwrights out of business. So again, English, um, he wrote this tract. Uh, for American shipbuilders, American shipbuilders already knew a thing or two about shipbuilding by this point. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, by 1761, one, one out of every four English ships was built in America. All right. And uh, this is the tract from the complete shipwright. Um, yeah, this is, uh, again, we're, we're getting a little bit more um, standardized. They've, they've learned from the Atlantic experience. They've learned from um, a lot of things, and the midship section is much more um, conservative, let's just say that as a nice flat floor like Raleigh talked about, a moderate easy bilge here, um, a little bit of tumble home, that's this angle angling of the top sides towards the center, a uh, good load carrier, they can fit a lot of cargo in this midship section, uh, and again it's very easily drawn out with this sort of grid system, uh, to which you plotted points and do arcs of circles or straight lines, okay? So, um, yeah, and here on the left, you can see uh, kind of how this was uh, broken out uh, to, uh, to come up with this midship section. So finally, by the late uh, 17th century, England and other nations had completed the transition from this shell first to partial framing to frame first construction. And here it is um, on the right, you can see finally, just like the Spanish um, did all those decades ago, um, English shipbuilders are now uh, developed these rigid endoskeleton, these frames uh, attached to the keel, to which planking is then attached, makes much infinitely stronger structure. Leaking went down, sinkings went down, the vessels were able to carry more cargo and, and, and more fierce seas. It was just a better, um, a better system all the way around. And um, they finally sort of freed themselves of that 
uh, Mediterranean stigma that was that said they had to build a shell first because that's what the Venetians did and they were so successful. It just took them a while to get their head around the North Atlantic, all right? Yeah, so we talked about this already, the flute design. Uh, you can see these are very purpose-built vessels, very, very pretty vessels, um, looking a lot like uh, modern vessels of the 19th century. Um, uh, focused on cargo capacity, fewer men, be a mechanical advantage, which we talked about. Reduced armament, that also meant reduced weight. Um, Dutch felt that you know they needed fewer armaments because these vessels could sail faster and better than most vessels out there. Um, lower aspect, that means less boat above the water. And of course, uh, the Dutch, Dutch East India Company, which sort of consolidated their trade monopoly with that uh, region. So William Sutherland, uh, by 1711, uh, the shipbuilder's assistant, is a well-drawn draft of a ship's hull on paper, okay, uh, showing surmarks which were used to align the various pieces of timber. Uh, these are the surmarks here that you would use to line up your frames. One of these frames are now, you know, built frame first. So they're, at the, they're just like this outward piece here as one piece and then lined up with these um, basically battens that were uh, bent along these frames to line them up relative to one another. And at this point, um, yeah, this is finally marking the final transition from sort of uh, shipbuilding as art first to more of a science, okay? The science of shipbuilding, uh, was now codified and could be put on paper and handed to a builder and said, here, build me this ship. He no longer um, relied upon this secret pool of knowledge swimming around in the shipbuilder's head where he said, I want to be, I want to be able to carry a lot of wine or a lot of grain to uh, the Mediterranean and the shipbuilder would say, okay, I think I know what you mean and go off and build a boat. And maybe it wasn't really what he wanted. So in conclusions, uh, Mediterranean, Influence profoundly affected English shipbuilding by extension, American shipbuilding, at least in the early, uh, late uh, 16th and early 17th century, uh, moving right to the mid uh, 17th century. Um, naval tactics shifted from grappling and board to stand off and shoot. And there was a gradual transition from shell first to frame first construction, which is basically every replica uh, sailing vessel built today, Calmer Nickel, um, Maryland Dove, all built with uh, what's called double sawn, uh, frames, which means the frames are um, pieced together and, and laminated to each other in two rows, so it's a very strong structure. Atlantic experience informed this transition and affected shape, uh, affected the hull shape, size, rig of vessels. Yeah, and as I just mentioned, shipbuilding began as an art and ended as a science. I still think it's an art. Anybody who builds a wooden boat uh, these days and takes a certain uh, aestheticism to it, you have a certain, um, certain things are still done by eye and uh, uh, and that's and that's a good thing. Uh, it keeps the uh, mystique of wooden built, boat building alive and well even in this present day. I think oh yeah, some sources if you uh, if you wanted to, or you can email me. I can give you plenty more sources than this. But these are some of the sources that were used. This Peter Marsden, Mary Rose, your noble ship is a fine set of volumes. Um, I don't know if the, the Calvin Marine Museum has this set, um, but we ought to. I should I should look into that. Um, so anyway, um, there's some uh, sources if you want to uh, do some further research. All right, we've kept it to an hour, which is a good thing. And um, are there any questions? Questions, comments, concerns? No? Please unmute if you want to ask. Oh, wait. Would ask that anybody who wants to ask a question, please unmute, or I can unmute. I can unmute everybody, maybe. No, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. Any other thoughts, questions? Well, I guess I have All one right. more thing. You said this was recorded. Where can we go to see this again? <laughs> uh i will i will let you know it'll be on our website at some point in time we need to be able to rescue it from the cloud first so we will we will we will let everybody know though and we'll we'll it'll it'll prominently be on our website uh in the near future but uh, but i can't give you a timeline necessarily that's fine thank you and, and it'll be there with all the other lectures as well once they're done and recorded so thank you Do you know in what stage of restoration the, the Mary Rose might be now? I visited a, a 
good number of years ago. Where I, do, I don't. I know that. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I haven't. Um, I haven't touched base with those folks in a while. Um, I'll tell you my funny story. I went over there to visit her when I was doing uh, some research on my uh, book on the Sparrowhawk, and I was told by their curator before I flew over there that the, it would be open. I got down to Portsmouth and it was closed. Nice. And I was very upset. Uh, but it happened to be the the anniversary of Nelson's death, so there was a big hullabaloo on the HMS Victory uh, about that. So I, I was I, I said I said, well, this isn't so bad. This is pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know though. They've got a great website. You could probably uh, touch base with them. Will do. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Make presentation. This, Thank you. This is John. Um, I have a question. Do you do you know the status of the um, the new no. uh, replica dove? Um, well, I was talking to Captain Gates, Will Gates. He he team teaches this class with me at St. Mary's College, and. Um, he said that uh, they were, I, I believe they're beginning to plank the vessel. The frames are all up and deck beams are in and they're beginning to secure the whales and planking. Um, if you go to um, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum's website, there's a photo essay, photo log of the whole construction process. And just check it out because that's probably pretty up to date, I would imagine, especially with COVID. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. All right. If there are no other thoughts or questions, I uh, want to invite you all back for lecture number three in two weeks. <laughs> Please remember not to get in on, uh, on next Thursday. I really apologize for that. I'm not sure if there was a miscommunication, but I want to thank Mark. Great lecture. Thank and you. I want to thank, I want to thank all of you for participating. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks um, for coming. I sure, I, sh I look forward to the day when we can do this in person, but this is, yeah. this is, this is the next best thing. So it is. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Take care, you everyone. Betcha. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.